Hello, this is Dr. Barry Singer, the director of the MS Center for Innovations of Care, Missouri Baptist Medical Center in St. Louis. Welcome to this video-based educational activity on disease-modifying therapies for multiple sclerosis management, focusing on updates from the recent American Academy of Neurology meeting in Boston, Massachusetts. The following audio is from a four-part presentation with Dr. Barry Singer. This audio is part of a certified educational activity titled Examining the Clinical Implications of Late-Breaking Data on Approved and Emerging Disease-Modifying Therapies for Multiple Sclerosis Management. What are the key learnings from Boston? To access the entire activity and complete the post-test, please go online to www.peerviewpress.com forward slash BCA. A printable monograph, slides, practice aids, and other features are also available. The 2017 Annual Meeting of the American Academy of Neurology was recently held in Boston, Massachusetts. A large number of platform presentations and posters on approved and some emerging disease-modifying therapies in various stages of clinical development were presented at this meeting. So let's begin by briefly discussing some updates on the various approved interferon beta preparations and glutamine acetate. At AAN 2017, Williamson and colleagues presented results from a post hoc analysis of the PRISMS trial aimed at determining the efficacy of thrice weekly interferon beta 1A 44 micrograms by baseline disease severity characteristics in patients with a relapsing remitting MS. The results of this analysis showed early treatment with thrice weekly interferon beta 1A 44 micrograms sub Q demonstrated clinical benefits compared with placebo or delayed treatment in patients with relapsing remitting MS with high or moderate baseline EDSS score, MSS score, and EDSS slash duration ratio, rate of disability accumulation. Friedman and colleagues also presented the results of a post hoc analysis of the Reflexion extension study which assess the differences in no evidence of clinical activity and no evidence of radiologic activity for patients receiving early compared with delayed treatment. No evidence of radiologic activity was defined as no gadolinium enhancing lesions and no new or enlarging T2 lesions. No evidence of clinical activity was defined as no relapses or disability worsening. The results of this analysis showed early treatment with interferon beta 1A 44 micrograms versus delayed treatment led to a greater proportion of patients with no evidence of either clinical or radiologic disease activity. In addition, early treatment with interferon beta 1A was associated with a higher odds of no evidence of clinical activity up to two years compared with delayed treatment. However, early treatment with interferon beta 1A thrice weekly versus once weekly or delayed treatment offered the best long-term benefit on no evidence of radiologic activity up to five years. Moving on to PEG interferon beta 1A. The ALLOW study, which was a 48-week phase 3B open-label randomized trial, evaluated flu-like symptoms in patients with relapsing MS who switched from a stable regimen of intermuscular interferon beta 1A, subcutaneous interferon beta 1A, or interferon beta 1B to PEG interferon beta 1A. At the 2017 AAM meeting, Hendon and his colleagues presented an analysis of this study, which assessed patient reported treatment satisfaction using the treatment satisfaction questionnaire for medication and patients who switched from non pegylated interferon therapy to pegylated interferon beta 1A, and whether the flu like symptoms, injection site reactions, and prior interferon use influenced treatment satisfaction with pegylated interferon beta 1A. Results show that patients switching from interferon beta 1A showed the greatest improvements in global satisfaction and convenience. In addition, matching adjusted indirect comparisons showed treatment with pegylated interferon beta 1A 125 micrograms every two weeks resulted in significantly lower proportion of patients with 24 week confirmed disability worsening a numerically lower annualized relapse rate compared with subcutaneous interferon beta 1A 44 micrograms thrice weekly in patients with relapsing MS. 
Treatment with pegylated interferon, 125 micrograms every two weeks, resulted in significantly lower proportion of patients with 12 or 24 week confirmed disability worsening or confirmed relapse and significantly lower annualized relapse rate compared with once weekly intermuscular interferon beta 1A, 30 micrograms, in patients with relapsing MS. Data on glutimer acetate, 40 milligrams thrice weekly, was also presented at the 2017 AAN meeting. Alexander and colleagues showed that GA40 treatment in the double-blind placebo-controlled phase of GALA resulted in a larger percentage of patients characterized as responders using various relapse and MRI metrics, gadolinium-enhancing lesions or new enlarging T2 lesions, compared with placebo. The treatment effect was more pronounced after excluding early disease activity, less than two months clinically or less than six months MRI. These various response definitions were used to investigate the best predictors of six-month confirmed disability progression in the open-label phase of GALA. In general, this analysis suggested that preventing relapses in the first year of GA40 treatment may be a better predictor of low six-month confirmed disability risk than preventing gadolinium-enhancing lesions or new enlarging T2 lesions. Neither gadolinium-enhancing lesions on T1 nor T2 MRI activity in the first six months of this double-blind placebo-controlled phase appears to be predictor of confirmed disability progression in the open-label phase. Now let's shift our focus to data presented on approved oral disease-modifying therapies. At AAN, Miller and colleagues reported the clinical and safety outcomes from patients with the first clinical episode suggestive of MS in the topic extension study through completion, up to seven years of treatment. In the combined core and extension studies, two-thirds of patients did not experience relapse, determining conversion to clinically definite MS. In addition, from course study randomization to the end of the extension, the risk of relapse determining conversion to clinically definite MS was lower in the 14 milligram to 14 milligram group versus the placebo to 14 milligram group. Most patients remained free from disability worsening confirmed for greater than or equal to 12 weeks for up to seven years. Data on the effect of teriflutamide on cortical gray matter atrophy in patients with the first clinical episode suggestive of MS and topic was also presented at the 2017 AAN meeting. Teraflutamide 14 milligrams demonstrate a statistically significant effect on reducing loss of cortical gray matter volume versus placebo, consistent across all time points sampled over two years in the topic course study. Annual cortical gray matter volume loss also has significant impact on conversion to clinically definite MS, with a 14.5% increase in the risk of clinically definite MS conversion for every 1% decrease in cortical gray matter volume. The correlation between the effects of teraflutamide and conversion of clinically definite MS and cortical gray matter volume loss indicates the potential clinical relevance of cortical gray matter volume loss in these patients and how teraflutamide may favorably impact the early inflammatory and neurodegenerative components of MS. In the TEMSO trial, structural image evaluation using normalization of atrophy, Sienna analysis, showed that teraflunamide significantly reduced brain volume loss versus placebo. At the 2017 AAN meeting, Sprenger and colleagues presented data on the predictive value brain volume loss during the first two years of the study on 12 and 24 week confirmed disability worsening over five years. The total population 709 was categorized into quartiles, Q1 to Q4, defined by the percentage brain volume changes from baseline to year two. In the quartile analysis, quarter one, the highest brain volume loss from baseline to year two, had a significantly higher probability of 12 and 24 week confirmed disability worsening after five years versus quartile four, the lowest brain volume loss. Quartile 1 versus quartile 4 hazard ratios for 12-week confirmed disability worsening, 0.611, and 24-week confirmed disability, 0.566. These analyses support the correlation between brain volume loss and long-term confirmed disability worsening, and the effects of teraflutamide on these outcomes, as well as highlighting the predictive value of brain volume loss early in the disease course. 
A number of posters on the long-term benefits of teraflutamide were also presented at the AAN 2017 meeting. In patients recently diagnosed with MS, a greater portion of patients receiving teraflutamide 14 milligrams had no evidence of MRI disease activity during the first two years of treatment versus those receiving placebo. This treatment benefit was reflected in a lower annualized relapse rate over a five-year period in teraflutamide-treated patients, and a higher proportion of those patients did not progress to VSS scores of greater than or equal to four or greater than or equal to six during nine years of follow-up. In addition, rates of more severe relapses resulting in hospitalization or relapses with sequela were consistently low over the long term. Long-term treatment for up to five years with teraflutamide 14 milligrams was associated with a very low risk of advancing to EDSS score of greater than or equal to six, greater than or equal to seven, confirmed for greater than or equal to 12 or greater than or equal to 24 weeks, and sustained to the last assessment. The phase four Terry Pro study evaluated treatment satisfaction, disability, and quality of life with teraflutamide using patient-reported outcomes. The effectiveness, safety, and tolerability of teraflutamide when used in routine clinical practice was also assessed. Real-world effectiveness and safety of teraflutamide were consistent with the results of the clinical development program. Disability remained stable over the course of the study, and patients switching to teraflutamide from another DMT. EDSS remained stable regardless of prior DMT. In addition, high levels of treatment satisfaction reported across all treatment satisfaction questionnaire medication domains were seen at weeks 4 and 48 of the Terry Pro study in patients with no prior treatment in the past two years prior to the study, as well as those who had switched from another DMT and those with prior DMT experience. Now let's turn our attention to some new data on fingolimod that was presented at the AAN 2017 meeting. So Vandenhoff and colleagues presented data from the multiple sclerosis and clinical outcome in MRI in the U.S., MS-MRI-U.S. study. MS-MRI-U.S. is a multicenter retrospective study that was designed to build a retrospective cohort of patients with relapsing remitting MS on fingolimod to assess its impact on brain atrophy, lesion burden, and disease progression and routine clinical practice. The primary MRI endpoints included annualized percent brain volume change and lateral ventricle volume change, accumulation of gadolinium enhancing lesions and new and enlarging T2 lesions, and absolute changes in T2 and T1 lesion volumes. Results from two groups in the intention to treat population, which included patients with and without a pre-indexed scans were presented. A total of 590 patients met the clinical and MRI inclusion-exclusion criteria at index. Of those, 184 also had pre-index MRI data. Median follow-up was 16 months. Median annualized percent brain volume change was negative 0.32% and negative 0.30% in the index to post-index period for the intention to treat population and the pre-index subgroup, respectively, and a negative 0.22% in the pre-index to index period. Median annualized percent lateral ventricle volume change increased by 0.66% and 2.26% in the index to post-index period for the intention to treat population and pre-index subgroup, respectively, and 2.23% to the pre-index to index period. The gadolinium enhancing lesion number was 0 0.80 at pre-index 0.68 at index and 0.11 at post-index, with 95% of fingolimod-treated patients having no gadolinium-enhancing lesions at post-index. New and enlarging T2 lesion accumulation, 0.99 in the pre-index to index and 0.44 in the index to post-index period, the accumulation of T2 and T1 lesion volume was lower in fingolimod. In addition, Weinstock Gutman presented an analysis MS MRI US focused NIDA 3 and NIDA 4 status in patients treated, being treated with fingolimod. NIDA 3 was defined as patients with no relapses, no disability progression. Progression defined as an increase in EDSS of greater than or equal to 1.5 points if your baseline EDSS was zero, or greater than or equal to one point if the baseline EDSS score was one to five, 
or greater than or equal to 0.5 points if the baseline EDSS was greater than 5, and no new or enlarging T2 lesions. NEDA 4 was defined as the components of NEDA 3, but also included the fourth criteria of no brain volume loss, annualized brain volume loss less than or equal to 0.4%. The results of this analysis show that among patients receiving fingolimod, over half achieved NEDA 3 status and over one-third achieved NEDA 4 status in the 483-day post-index period. Dwyer and colleagues presented data from the MS MRI US study evaluating the feasibility of brain atrophy measurement in the routine clinical practice. A total of 571 patients were included in this analysis. The results of this analysis showed that the lateral ventricle volume estimations on flare scans was feasible in more than 95% of patients and suggested the most suitable measure of brain atrophy for routine practice. Looking to the data presented on dimethylfumarate, PROTEC was a phase four open label single arm study that was conducted to evaluate the effectiveness of DMF on disease activity and patient reported outcomes in patients with relapsing remitting MS in a real world clinical setting. A total of 1,113 patients were enrolled. Eligible patients, 1,105, received greater than or equal to one dose of dimethylfumarate. At the 2017 AAM meeting, Berger and colleagues presented data on a post hoc analysis of this study to evaluate the effectiveness of DMF as measured by annualized relapse rate and patient reported outcomes in newly diagnosed and other patients with early MS. Annualized relapse rate at 12 months after DMF initiation was 84% lower than the annualized relapse rate estimated for the 12 months before DMF initiation in newly diagnosed patients and 77%, 71%, and 75% lower in the patients in the EDSS, relapse, and EDSS plus relapse subgroups, respectively. Significant improvements in mean scores from baseline to 12 months were observed across all the early MS subgroups for each of the following patient reported outcomes. Multiple sclerosis impact scale, five item modified fatigued impact scale, Uroqual, five dimensions, five-level version, visual analog scale. Safety data in the early MS subgroups were consistent with the overall study population. A similar analysis from the RESPOND study was also presented. RESPOND was conducted to evaluate DMF in patients with relapsing MS after suboptimal response to glutirmer acetate in real-world clinical settings. In the overall study population, DMF was associated with a 78% lower annualized relapse rate 12 months after initiation versus 12 months before, and stable or improved patient reported outcomes with baseline to 12 months after initiation. At the AN 2017 meeting, Cressa, Rial, and colleagues presented the results of a post hoc analysis of RESPOND, which evaluated the effectiveness of DMF in patients whose only prior MS therapy was GA, first switch patients, including patients with early MS, early MS switch patients. In the first switch and the early MS switch patients with relapsing MS, annualized relapse rate at 12 months after DMF initiation was associated with a lower annualized relapse rate than that reported for the 12 months before DMF initiation. The majority of patients, 93%, were relapse-free 12 months after DMF initiation. Statistically significant improvements from baseline to 12 months were observed for the patient reported outcomes, SF36, PCS and MCS, MFIS5, BDI7, and MMAS8 for the first switch and early MS switch patients with less than or equal to one relapse in the prior year to the study enrollment. Seven-year data from the DEFINE, CONFIRM, and ENDORSE were also presented in Boston. Gold and colleagues showed that annualized relapse rate and the proportion of patients with 24-week confirmed disability progression remain low in newly diagnosed patients with relapsing remitting MS treated with DMF over seven years. In the placebo switch to DMF patients, annualized relapse rate was reduced significantly after switching to DMF. And in the DMF continuing on DMF group and the placebo switch to DMF treatment groups, 55 and 48% of patients respectively remain free from clinical disease activity over seven years. 
In addition, Arnold and colleagues showed that new enlarging T2 lesions in DMF to DMF group remain low over seven years. Placebo to DMF and GA to DMF patients had reduced frequency and new and enlarging T2 lesions after switching to DMF and remained low at year seven. Lastly, Pazilli and colleagues showed at seven years, adverse events and serious adverse events occurring in the overall safety and newly diagnosed populations were consistent with the known DMF safety profile. The incidence of serious infections, potential hepatic disorders, and malignancies remain low in all treatment groups. Aside from the one case of PML, there's no increased incidence of opportunistic infections. After seven years of treatment with DMF, these findings suggest DMF has a favorable benefit-risk profile in patients with relapsing remitting MS. Moving on to data presented on approved monoclonal antibodies for the treatment of MS. To begin, Spellman and colleagues presented a subgroup analysis from the Natalizumab Observational Program, TOP, compared outcomes for treatment-naive patients who began taking this agent shortly after MS symptom onset, less than or equal to one year, with those who initiated natalizumab after experiencing MS symptoms for greater than one year and less than or equal to five years, or greater than five years. Over three years, the likelihood of disability improvement was significantly greater for patients treated with natalizumab within one year of MS symptom onset, 49.3%, than for those treated between one to five years, 38.1%, or more than five years, 26.3% following symptom onset. Natalizumab treatment also significantly reduced analyzed relapse rate compared with baseline in all three cohorts. Additional top data presented in Boston show that these patients who continue natalizumab treatment experience better clinical outcomes than those who switch to another therapy. Turning our attention to alentuzumab, at the 2017 AAM meeting, data from the CARMS-1 and CARMS-2 studies at six years follow-up were presented. In both of these studies, alentuzumab treated patients with RRMS who were treatment-naive, CARMS-1, or had inadequate response to prior therapy, CARMS-2, received two courses of alentuzumab, 12 milligrams, five days at baseline, three days at month 12. Patients completing CARMS-1 or CARMS-2 could enter the respective extension studies with as needed alentuzumab treatment for relapse or MRI activity. Another disease-modifying therapy was allowed per investigator discretion. Looking at the six-year clinical outcomes of CARMS-1, 93% of patients who enrolled in the CARMS-1 extension remained in the study through six years. The low annualized relapse rate observed in the course study, years 0 to 2, 0.13, was maintained over years 3 through 6, 0.15. Through years 0 to 6, 77% of patients were free of six-month confirmed disability worsening, and 34% achieved six-month confirmed disability improvement. Infusion-associated reaction, infection, and serious adverse incidents during the extension were reduced versus course study. The incidence of thyroid adverse events peaked at year three, then declined. When we examine the six-year MRI brain volume changes from CARMS-1, through six years, most patients remain free of new gadolinium-enhancing lesions, new enlarging T2 lesions, and new T1 hypo-intense lesions and 87%, 67%, and 82% near six, respectively. In addition, at the end of the two-year core CARMS-1 study, alentuzumab slowed brain volume loss by 42% versus thrice-weekly interferon beta-1A at the end of the two-year core MS-1 study. This slowing of the brain volume loss in alentuzumab-treated patients was maintained through six years. Moreover, median yearly brain volume loss progressively decreased over two years, 0.25% at year two. In CARMS-1, alentuzumab-treated patients remained low in years three through six, negative 0.17% at year six. Moving on to the six-year clinical outcomes of CARMS-2, 344 out of 393, 88% of patients who enrolled in the CARMS-2 extension remained in the study through six years. Through year six, 72% of patients were free of six-month confirmed disability worsening, 
and 43% achieved six-month disability improvement. 77.4% of patients had stable or improvement in ESS score from baseline at year six. 55% received no additional courses of alentuzumab, and 90% received no other DMT. When we examine the six-year MRI and brain volume changes from CARAMS2, in each individual year of the extension, high proportions of patients remain free of new gadolinium-enhancing lesions, new and enlarging T2 lesions, and new T1 hypointense lesions. In year six, 91%, 69%, and 86 to 93% respectively. The slowing of brain volume loss in alentuzumab treated patients was maintained through six years of extension. Median yearly brain volume loss progressively decreased over two years in CARAMS2 alentuzumab treated patients and remained low. Year six, 0.10%. Additional six year data from CARAMS1 and CARAMS2 showed among alentuzumab treated CARAMS1 or 2 patients, four, 1.1%, and 16, 3.7%, respectively, pooled 20, 2.5%, met the optimal definition of secondary progressive MS through six years, based on the publication by Lorscheider and all. The results of sensitivity analysis that evaluated different confirmation periods showed that over six years, a lower proportion of patients converted to secondary progressive MS, confirmed over six, 12, and 24 months. No patients converted to secondary progressive MS confirmed over 24 months. In the DECIDE study, diclizumab was shown to be superior to intramuscular interferon beta-1A on key clinical, radiologic, cognitive, and functional outcomes. In addition, whole brain volume loss was lower on diclizumab than intramuscular interferon beta-1A between baseline and week 96. At the 2017 AAN meeting, Rose and colleagues presented data on the effects of diclizumab versus intramuscular interferon beta-1A on MRI markers of brain tissue loss. Percentage changes from the baseline to thalamic volume was significantly lower in diclizumab-treated patients versus intramuscular interferon beta-1A treated patients at weeks 24 and 96. In addition, percentage changes from baseline and cortical gray matter volume were also significantly lower with diclizumab versus intramuscular interferon beta-1A at weeks 24 and 96. EXTEND is an open, ongoing open-label multi-center extension study to evaluate the safety and efficacy of long-term diclizumab treatment in patients with relapsing MS who completed a side or transition from selected or observed. Patients treated with diclizumab or intramuscular interferon beta-1A and decide received diclizumab 150 milligrams subcutaneous every four weeks for up to five additional years in EXTEND. A total of 1,516 patients received greater than or equal to one dose of diclizumab and decide in EXTEND. At the 2017 AAM meeting, Cohen and colleagues presented data on the effects of diclizumab on brain MRI lesion activity after 48 weeks of the treatment in EXTEND in patients who completed decide. The results of this analysis showed the benefits on brain MRI lesion activity observed with diclizumab over two to three years into side were maintained with continuous treatment in the first year of EXTEND. Increased benefits on brain MRI lesion activity were observed in patients switching from intramuscular interferon beta-1A and decide to diclizumab and EXTEND. Looking at some additional data on diclizumab selection, was a 52-week randomized double-blind extension study of SELECT that evaluated the safety and efficacy of treatment with diclizumab. It also assessed the impact of a 24-week treatment interruption. At AAN 2017, Gio Vanoni and colleagues showed that in the 24 weeks after the interruption of treatment with diclizumab, mean annualized relapse rate and gadolinium-enhancing lesion activity did not exceed pretreatment levels. In addition, a Bayesian random effects mixed treatment comparison of diclizumab versus other DMTs for relapsing MS was presented by Wakeford and colleagues. In this respect, diclizumab showed better clinical outcomes for annualized relapse rate and disability progression in the majority of the comparisons versus a large number of other currently approved DMTs in patients with relapsing remitting MS.
No comparisons were statistically significant for 12 and 24 week confirmed disability progression. Let's move on to the latest addition to the MS treatment armamentarium. Ocrelizumab, a humanized monoclonal antibody that selectively targets CD20 positive B cells, was superior in reducing clinical and MRI measures of disease activity compared with interferon beta-1A over 96 weeks in two identical phase three trials in relapsing MS, OPER1 and OPER2. At the 2017 AAN meeting, Hauser and colleagues presented data from exploratory post hoc analysis evaluating the rapidity of the onset of clinical efficacy of ocrelizumab in patients with relapsing MS. In the pooled analysis, ocrelizumab reduced annualized relapse rate from baseline to week 96 by 46.5% versus interferon beta 1A. Kaplan Meyer analysis showed that ocrelizumab reduced the cumulative probability of relapse versus interferon beta 1A as early as week 8. Reduction in annualized relapse rate with ocrelizumab versus interferon beta 1A were also observed from baseline to week 8, baseline to week 24, and baseline to week 48. Naismith and colleagues also presented data from the open label extension of OPER1 and OPER2. During the open-label extension study, patients originally in the ocrelizumab group continued ocrelizumab, and patients on the interferon beta-1A group were switched to ocrelizumab. The preliminary results of the open-label extension showed patients who originally received ocrelizumab in the OPERA studies continue to have favorable annualized relapse rate and MRI, new and enlarging T2 lesions and gadolinium-enhancing lesion outcomes. In addition, patients who switched from interferon beta-1A to ocrelizumab in the open-label extension rapidly experienced annualized relapse rate reduction and MRI outcomes consistent with those patients who received continuous ocrelizumab. Moreover, Hardova presented data with respect to the proportion of early relapsing MS patients, MS symptoms onset less than or equal to two years, who were also treatment naive, with NIDA following treatment with ocrelizumab versus interferon beta-1A in a pool analysis of OPER1 and OPER2 studies. The results of this analysis showed ocrelizumab increased the proportion of patients maintaining NIDA by 76% compared to interferon beta-1A. In a separate analysis, Trabusi and colleagues showed ocrelizumab reduced brain MRI lesion activity and the rate of brain volume loss versus interferon beta-1A in patients with early relapsing MS. In the oratorio trial, ocrelizumab demonstrated superior efficacy compared with placebo in patients with primary progressive MS. The primary endpoint was time to onset of 12-week confirmed disability progression, as measured by EDSS. Fatigue is commonly reported by patients with MS. However, its relationship with confirmed disability progression is not well understood in primary progressive MS. At AAN 2017, Miller and colleagues showed CDP was strongly associated with increased fatigue, underlying the importance of preventing disease progression in patients with primary progressive MS. Furthermore, the significant reduction in fatigue reported by patients without 12-week confirmed disability progression while treated with ocrelizumab compared with placebo suggests a beneficial effect of ocrelizumab even in those primary progressive patients without documented disease progression. The safety and efficacy of ocrelizumab have been characterized in phase two and phase three studies in patients with MS. Updated safety data from the controlled and open-label extension periods of the clinical trials of ocrelizumab and relapsing remitting MS, relapsing MS, and primary progressive MS was also presented at AN 2017. The ocrelizumab all-exposure population is generally consistent with the control treatment period for the relapsing MS and primary progressive MS populations. Lastly, let's evaluate data on a few emerging therapies under investigation for the treatment of MS. Uzanamod is an oral selective sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor modulator in development for relapsing MS. Radiance is an ongoing phase two slash three trial. The 24-week placebo-controlled phase two portion demonstrated the efficacy and safety of Uzanamod 0.5 and 1.0 milligrams. In the 96-week blinded extension, patients originally randomized ozonamide continued their assigned dose, 0.5 milligrams or 1.0 milligrams, 
whereas placebo patients were re-randomized one-to-one to to azonamon 0.5 milligrams or 1.0 milligrams. At AAN 2017, Cohen and colleagues presented the results of the two-year blinded extension irradiance. At extension week 96, the mean number of gadolinium-enhancing lesions was 0.3 for patients on the 0.5 milligram dose and 0.1 for the 1 milligram dose, compared to 0.4 and 0.1 respectively at week 48. The proportion of patients who were free of gadolinium-enhancing lesions was 91% for 0.5 milligrams and 89% for 1 milligram dose. The cumulative number of new enlarging T2 lesions was 1.8 for the 0.5 milligram dose and 0.6 for the 1 milligram dose at week 96, compared to 1.3 and 0.7 respectively at week 48. The effect on unadjusted annualized relapse rate was maintained in both azonamod dose groups. No evidence of disease activity was achieved in 44% and 39% of patients in the extension week 48 and 96 respectively on the 0.5 milligram dose, 62% and 47% on the 1 milligram dose. Averse event profiles were comparable across groups. Minor infections and headache were the most common averse events. Consistent with extension week 48 data, no noteworthy occurrences of cardiac, pulmonary, serious opportunist infections, ophthalmologic, or malignancy-related adverse events were observed. No first-dose adverse events of bradycardia, greater than or equal to secondary AV block, or macular edema were reported. Elevated alanine aminotransferase occurred in 11 patients, 4.4%, approximately evenly across doses. These efficacy, tolerability, and safety results support the ongoing Phase three radiance, Part B, and Sunbeam studies. The study design and baseline characteristics of the Phase three radiance, Part B, and Sunbeam trials were also presented at 2017 AAN meeting. Both studies are randomized, double-blind, double-dummy, active control, parallel group studies of patients with relapsing MS. In the Radiance Part B, patients were randomized one to one to one to receive once daily oral azonamide 0.5 milligrams or 1.0 milligrams or weekly intramuscular interferon beta 1A 30 micrograms for 24 months. The primary endpoint was annualized relapse rate at month 24. In Sunbeam, patients were randomized to one to one to one to receive once daily oral azonamide 0.5 milligrams or 1.0 milligrams or weekly intramuscular interferon beta 1A 30 micrograms for greater than or equal to 12 months. Patients will continue assigned treatment until the last enrolled patient has been treated for 12 months. The primary endpoint was annualized relapse rate during the treatment period. Randomization was stratified by EDSS less than or equal to 3.5 or greater than 3.5 and country in both studies. In addition, ozonamide was dose escalated over the seven days to attenuate the first dose effects. Ozonamide 0.25 milligrams on days one to four, ozonamide 0.5 milligrams on days five to seven, and assigned starting dose on day eight, the beginning of each study. The baseline characteristics of patients in both studies are similar and consistent with relapsing MS population study to date. It was recently announced the Sunbeam study met its primary endpoint of reducing annualized relapse rate versus intramuscular beta-1A and its key secondary endpoints. Primary results from Radiance Part B are also expected in 2017. Moving on, sapanamod is selective sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor modulator with peripheral and central effects. At AAN 2017, Kapos and colleagues presented the results of the Phase three EXPAND trial, which compared saponamide to placebo in patients with secondary progressive MS. In this trial, patients were randomized 2 to 1 to once daily saponamide 2 milligrams or placebo. Overall, 1,651 patients were randomized. The primary endpoint of this event, an exposure-driven study, was time to three-month confirmed disability progression assessed by EDSS. Saponamon significantly reduced the risk of three-month confirmed disability progression by 21% versus placebo. Point estimates in favor of saponamon were consistently observed across predefined subgroups. Saponamon significantly reduced the risk of six-month confirmed disability progression by 26%, annualized relapse rate by 55.5%, gadolinium-enhancing lesions by 86.6% and 
and new and enlarging T2 lesions by 81% compared to placebo. The risk reduction observed for time 25-foot walk was 6.2% compared to placebo and not statistically significant. The most common treatment emerging adverse events, greater than 10% in any group, were headache, nasopharyngitis, urinary tract infection, falls, and hypertension. Serious treatment emerging adverse events were reported in 17.9% and 15.2% of the saponamon and placebo groups respectively, including four deaths in each treatment group, 0.4% and 0.7%. Incidence of infections and malignancies were similar. With dose titration during treatment initiation, there were only a few bradyarrhythmic events. No cases of MOBITS 2 or higher degree AV blocks were reported. ALKS-8700 is an oral prodrug of monomethyl fumarate, which is an active metabolite of dimethyl fumarate. This agent has been designed to treat relapsing remitting MS in a similar manner as DMF, but the potential for improvement in GI tolerability. In addition, phase one data show that ALKS-8700, 462 milligrams of BID, yields comparable monomethyl fumarate exposure to DMF-240 milligrams BID. ALKS-8700 is currently undergoing phase three evaluation to determine the long-term safety and tolerability of this agent in patients with relapsing remitting MS. 543 patients are currently enrolled and recruitment for the study is ongoing. Ofatumumab is the first fully human anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody with a low dose monthly subcutaneous dosing regimen tailored for treatment of MS. Analysis of the phase two MIR study showed that efficacy of ofatumumab could be explained through its effect on B cell counts. These results support the ofatumumab dosing regimen involving initial loading dose of 20 milligrams given weekly over the first three weeks, followed by a 20 milligrams maintenance dose after week four, given every four weeks, and an ongoing phase three trials. Finally, preliminary data from a phase two A clinical trial on ublituximab was also presented at the 2017 AAN meeting. Ublituximab is a novel glycoengineered chimeric anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody under investigation for the treatment of relapsing MS. Preliminary results of a phase two A study indicated that treatment with agent resulted in median 99% depletion of B cells in patients with relapsing MS and two infusions with a cumulative dose of 600 milligrams. This was comparable to previous reports on ocrelizumab and rituximab. The most commonly reported adverse events were infusion-related reactions, grade less than or equal to two, with the median time of study of five months. This study is ongoing with clinical and MRI measures expected to be reported at future congresses. In conclusion, recently presented data continue to add to our breadth of knowledge on the efficacy and safety of conventional injectable DMTs for relapsing MS. New analysis of recent clinical trials and their extension studies provide new insight into the long-term efficacy and safety of approved oral disease-modifying therapies, as well as their impact on patient-reported outcomes. Late-breaking data on approved monoclonal antibodies provide additional understanding and the potential benefits of these therapies with respect to their effectiveness in early disease, durable efficacy, rapidity of onset, and safety in patients with MS. There are also a number of emerging disease-modifying therapies in various stages of development for the treatment of either relapsing or progressive forms of MS. It has not been determined how these potential advances might fit into the current treatment landscape. That ends our discussion for today. I hope you found it informative and useful for your practice. I encourage you to download the slides and practice aids from this activity, which includes summaries of additional data not discussed during this program. Thank you. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening to this activity. To view the rest of the CME activity, download materials, and complete the post-test for instant credit, please go online to www.
www.peerviewpress.com forward slash BCA. This activity is supported by educational grants from Celgene Corporation, Genentech, and Sanofi Genzyme.